Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled World War I, Progressive Fulfillment or Defeat? Let's look at three topics associated with Wilsonian progressivism and the coming and prosecution of World War I. Free trade and peace were articles of faith among Wilsonian progressives. Reliance on expertise to craft and implement policy is something that we see as well, as is organization of resources and management of production during wartime. Let's look at these things piece by piece. On free trade and peace, Wilson maintained the neutrality of the United States from 1914 to 1917 that was consistent with the Monroe Doctrine. Open seas was his principal aim as the right of neutrals. He defined open seas as the ability of Americans, and by implication other neutrals, to travel on any merchant ship of any nation. The difficulty with the open seas concept and U.S. neutrality was what was called unrestricted submarine warfare. This phrase meant only that submarines could, quote unquote, sink without warning, which went against so-called prize rules that had for a couple of centuries required ships to be stopped, searched, and evacuated before they were sunk unless that ship tried to run or resist. Fragile submarines could not operate that way. After limited success against British warships and in response to the successful and savage British blockade that went so far as to declare food as contraband, the German Navy opened unrestricted submarine warfare of its own against British and non-belligerent commerce vessels in a specified war zone around England and Ireland on February 4th, 1915. Germany published its aims and published warnings adjacent to advertisements for sailing of merchant and passenger vessels. This declaration came after the British authorized use of false neutral flags to disguise its blockade runners. German political leaders feared unrestricted submarine warfare would bring neutrals like the United States into the war. Although it was not the first casualty of unrestricted submarine warfare, pursuant to the February 4th declaration. The sinking of the RMS Lusitania by U-boat on May 7th, 1915, with 128 U.S. citizens killed, set the U.S. on a course of entering the war. Wilson remonstrated against Germany, but refused to go to war at that point. He sent three increasingly hard diplomatic notices to Germany, the second was so bellicose that Wilson's Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, resigned in protest. The American Rights Committee and other interventionist groups that we'll also talk about in a minute, formed after the Lusitania sinking. They whipped pro-war and interventionist sentiment into a frenzy that had little play outside of the industrialized Northeast. These groups wanted to push Wilson to break diplomatic relations with Germany. They continued to operate to pressure the U.S. to enter the war on the side of Great Britain. A little bit later in 1915, August 19, 1915 to be exact, when U-boats sank the SS Arabic, which was a white star liner, Germany was finally persuaded by the U.S. reaction to suspend unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic, which they did on October 5th, 1915. That is, they said subs were to fire only on ships of belligerents. Unrestricted submarine warfare continued in the Mediterranean, but it too was altered about a month later after the sinking of the SS Ancona on November 7th, 1915. Now, unrestricted submarine warfare against British ships continued, and Americans continued to die. On March 24, 1916, a U-boat torpedoed the Channel Transport Sussex, which capped a month of similar sinkings, all of which killed Americans. In the wake of increased anti-Mexican furor in the United States, Wilson remonstrated again, and the Germans relented on any unrestricted submarine warfare. 
That is, until they resumed it on February 1st, 1917. Here's a slide of the RMS Lusitania and the German notice. Here's a slide of the Arabic. Wilson attempted to broker peace in 1916 and 1917. After staving off fierce attempts by those who wanted aggressive leadership and tried to pressure him toward war as submarines continued to kill Americans, Wilson thought all the domestic progressive gains of his and his predecessors would be lost if he committed to war. War means autocracy, he wrote to one political advisor. He sought to negotiate peace based on a vague idea at first of quote unquote peace without victory. But German general staff knew they were going to reinstitute unrestricted submarine warfare in 1917. So the German government made a peace offer based on the status quo at that moment. That was December 12th, 1916. But they did so in bad faith. After another month of wrangling with Congress and with his advisors, Wilson firmed up his idea of peace without victory and made a last ditch appeal to England and Germany to come to the peace table. On January 22, 1917, he delivered his peace without victory speech to Congress. He called for the equality of all nations, for the rights of subject people to self-determination, he called for freedom of the seas and a reduction of the huge armies and caches of arms that had taken place in the early 1900s. Now, the interventionist wing of the Republicans, led by Theodore Roosevelt, Elihu Root, and Henry Cabot Lodge since 1914, had wanted the U.S. to enter the war on the side of Great Britain. They had initiated a preparedness campaign beginning in 1914 that was pushed primarily by Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, the Army League, the Navy League, and groups, like I've said before, the American Rights Committee. Wilson resisted this. His resistance was made easier because he had the backing of anti-preparedness, anti-militarism progressive groups, such as the League to Limit Armaments, and the Women's Peace Party of Carrie Chapman Catt and Jane Addams. Now, Wilson had to play both sides, the anti-preparedness and the preparedness sides, and he was truly conflicted. He moved toward preparedness as early as the summer of 1915, and then he fully committed in November of 1915. The preparedness campaign resulted in the National Defense Act of 19. 16 that increased the size of the peacetime army to over 200,000 men, federalized the National Guard to act as a reserve, and created the Council of National Defense, a kind of a war cabinet, to run the U.S. economy in the event of war. The Council of National Defense, as we'll say in a minute, proved to be particularly ineffective and other means had to be exerted. The preparedness campaign also resulted in the Navy Bill of 1916 that funded a large Navy. In its first year, the Navy Bill called for four battleships to be built, four battle cruisers to be built, 20 destroyers, 30 submarines, and various smaller ships to be built. This was a three-year bill. The preparedness campaign also resulted in the so-called Shipping Bill of 1916 that created a government-funded merchant marine as well as the U.S. Shipping Board. It gave the U.S. Shipping Board exceptional power in the event of war. Eventually, we moved from peace to war in 1917. Because Germans had made gains on the ground in 1916, their high command decided in December and January to resume unrestricted submarine warfare as of February 1st, 1917. They thought they could starve England into submission before the U.S. could mobilize and enter the war, which they knew would happen. 
But Wilson resisted the push toward war until late February and into March with the release of the Zimmerman telegram. There's some controversy as to whether the Zimmerman telegram was real or was concocted by the British government to entice the U.S. into war. This so-called Zimmerman telegram was supposedly sent by German Foreign Minister Zimmerman to the German ambassador to Mexico, authorizing that ambassador to offer an alliance to Mexico if the U.S. declared war on Germany. In this alliance, if the U.S. declared war on Germany, Mexico was to declare war on the U.S. and invite Japan into a three-part alliance. Then when the U.S. was defeated, as the Germans expected they would be, Mexico was to receive most of the territory it had lost to the U.S. at the end of the Mexican War in 1848. The telegram was transmitted from the British interceptors to Wilson on February 25th, and he released it to the press in early March as he was trying to get a bill passed in Congress authorizing him to use whatever force he thought appropriate to save American honor. Then on March 18th, the city of Memphis, the Illinois, and the Vigilancia were all sunk. This led Wilson to realize he could not avoid war, so he called for Congress to declare war on April 2nd. Congress obliged on April 6th. Was the war progressive? Let's talk about mobilization and progressivism, war collectivism, and public-private cooperation. Historian Ellis Hawley writes that people of the U.S. organized into new institutions capable of mobilizing for war, but unlike existing ways of doing things in the U.S., he says that the U.S. created its own version of what in Europe was called war collectivism. Public and private cooperation to create war bureaucracy and to control the economy and society were hallmarks of the American version of war collectivism, not merely government edict, but public-private cooperation. One of the hallmarks of this and of progressivism was market management by professional experts. The Council of National Defense in 1916 operated a little like a war cabinet, again authorized by the National Defense Act of 1916. It also had a Women's Committee, Council of National Defense. There were branches of the CND in all states. These were staffed by appointees from governors, and most of these were highly ineffective. The Wilson administration, therefore, created a number of executive committees, executive bodies, executive agencies, if you will, to manage the economy in light of the failure of the CND. Let's look at a few of these before you. The U.S. Food Administration was one of these. This was administered under food czar Herbert Hoover. In July of 1917, Hoover held a nationwide registration for service that used pledge cards and he promoted victory gardens. Food production was raised on farms and coordinated and voluntary restrictions such as wheatless Mondays, meatless Tuesdays, porkless Thursdays and Saturdays all became the mantra of the people. Another of these executive bodies was the War Industry Board under Bernard Baruch, a Wall Street speculator. It formed in July of 1917 and reorganized in 1918 to better coordinate key raw materials and to coordinate industrial manufacturing. The War Trade Board controlled imports and exports, and it waged economic warfare on Germany. The U.S. Railroad Administration, under Secretary of the Treasury and Wilson's son-in-law, William McAdoo, was charged with unsnarling massive rail tie-ups in the Northeast, and in December 1917, federalized, that is, took over, all of the rail lines in the U.S. It took until late in 1918 to unsnarl all of this traffic 
The War Finance Board was created in 1918 to mobilize capital, and labor had a voice in this through the National War Labor Board that allowed collective bargaining, and the War Labor Policies Board that coordinated benefits to labor in exchange for a no-strike pledge, such as the eight-hour day, time and a half for overtime, and many of the things that we take for granted today. There is also social management, that is, managing people for war purposes. Home economists, employment managers, recreation managers, school, church, health administrators, and social workers were all given space to create an American brand of social engineering, according to Ellis Hawley. One of the most important committees that came about during this war collectivism in order to manage American society was the Committee of Public Information, the CPI. This was under the control of journalist and ad man and, and radical leftist, actually, George Creel, whose job it was to sell the war. He called for self-censorship, though he never used that word, for newspapers immediately. And he and his staff created a huge array of news releases, films, posters, pamphlets, and speakers known as the Four Minute Men and Four Minute Women. In addition to the CPI, the president co-opted compliant unions. The AFL was made a junior partner in war work with the right to bargain collectively. Consequently, union membership grew by 35% from 1916 until 1918. If you didn't comply, you were suppressed. Loyalty organizations subverted non-official narratives and alternatives to the war narrative. Vigilantes, usually nativists, bucked up against who they considered to be subversives. They feared German Americans, Irish Americans, and African Americans, and thought of them as a fifth collar. In fact, in many places, Germans were forced to change their names. Food was renamed. For example, the hamburger became a Salisbury steak. In the South, many of these nativists wanted blacks subjected to military discipline or under the control of home guards, that is, drafted into labor battalions to be used on farms and overseen by military discipline. One group who was particularly savage in its suppression of dissent was the National Security League. By 1916, before we got into the war, the National Security League had 155 chapters in 42 states with 50,000 members. Its program was simply to eliminate traces of foreigners, people it called deviants, and people it called undesirables. In 1918, the National Security League became the first political action committee in the United States. It used its money and its influence to defeat congressional candidates it did not like. In addition, there was official suppression of dissent. The Espionage Act, passed in June of 1917, published false statements made if they interfered with mobilization or the draft. This was so broad that hundreds of people were sentenced to jail based on Title I. Many socialist newspapers lost mailing privileges for criticizing the government, and in some cases, advertisers were threatened with the loss of fuel if they continued to advertise with socialist newspapers. Eugene Debs and Congressman Victor Berger, as well as many other socialists, were imprisoned for sometimes vague statements they made in support of peace. On September 17, 1917, 169 industrial workers of the world, wobbly leaders, were imprisoned in raids. Vigilantes were allowed to wreck offices later. The Sedition Act of 1918 amended the Espionage Act and criticized coarse or profane language against the American flag, the military, or the government, 
in direct violation of the First Amendment of the United States. Now, all of this coalesced into the Red Scare of 1917 to 1920. This was the first real Red Scare in the U.S. in the 20th century. It was sparked not only by this polarization in American society that had occurred between the pro-war and the anti-war elements, and then Woodrow Wilson's kind of autocratic bearing and refusal to allow people to dissent from him. And he used his presidential power and Congress used its power to make that attitude into law. And of course, they completely justified it by the emergency at the time, which made sense to them, but in hindsight seemed to be a little draconian. Nevertheless, as vigilantes and officialdom cracked down on dissent, it wouldn't take much of a spark to set off actual hysteria. Part of what did set off the Red Scare, which was hysterical in 1917, was the Bolshevik Revolution. In 1917, Russia withdrew from the war right after the March Revolution, which was not the Bolshevik Revolution, under Alexander Kerensky. Then in October, on our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, it was November. Lenin and Trotsky led the Bolshevik Revolution. At that point, Russia was completely out of the war, and in fact, the Bolshevik Revolution could not have occurred had not many of the radicalized troops fled the Eastern Front and gone back to St. Petersburg or Moscow. One of the things that these guys did was to threaten socialist revolution worldwide, and that really frightened American, even progressives, because they were not about a violent revolution to overthrow capitalism. They may have wanted socialism, they may have wanted to ameliorate capitalism, but they were not at all interested in violent revolution. There were violent revolutionaries in the United States. Another thing that triggered this was that in 1919, four million workers went out on 3,600 strikes. There had been no strikes at all in 1917 and 1918 because of a pledge of union workers, AFL workers, IWW went out on strikes, but nobody really cared. But AFL workers went out on 3,600 strikes in 1919. Some were economic, but others were political. General strikes occurred in Seattle and Winnipeg in which workers took over the government of their cities. Public service and major industrial strikes occurred as well, like the Boston police strike that led to Calvin Coolidge's ascent eventually to the presidency and a nationwide steel strike that the strikers were highly influenced by the rhetoric of the socialist revolution, and so they adopted a lot of that rhetoric, and it just scared the hell out of non-strikers. In addition, the summer of 1919 saw a number of white riots against African Americans, the largest and most violent of which was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in which whites pretty much burned the African American section of town to the ground and ran off at least half of the African American population of Tulsa, Oklahoma. There was agitation in the wake of the war and fear of Bolshevism plus the political ambition of the Attorney General of the United States shown here, A. Mitchell Palmer, which led to the so-called Palmer Raids of November 1919 through January of 1920. Having threatened to run all radicals out of the U.S., Palmer's house was bombed. Within days, he authorized raids on labor halls and offices, labor newspapers, and all known meeting places where radical leftists like Socialist and IWW met. Anarchists and IWW were rounded up and about 500 were deported, some of them to countries that did not want them. In summary, President Woodrow Wilson tried to keep the United States out of World War I because he feared that entering the war would wreck all of the progressive programs of the previous 20 years. Most of the population of the U.S. supported peace 
right up until March 1917. There was, however, a significant contingent of political and social leaders that wanted intervention. They were loud and they were close to the levers of power, but they represented no constituency outside the Northeast. Unrestricted submarine warfare is practiced by Germany against not only its enemy's warships, but also against neutral shipping, justified as it might have been by the necessities of industrial warfare, eventually pressured the United States into entering the war. Beginning with the National Defense Act of 1916, that increased the size of the Army, federalized the National Guard, and created the Council of National Defense, the U.S. engaged in an Americanized version of war collectivism that, according to historian Ellis Hawley, was the culmination of the progressive bent toward organization and administrative efficiency. The Council of National Defense failed to take charge of the problems facing the United States war-making infrastructure, so the Wilson administration created temporary administrative agencies to handle portions of the economy. For example, to unsnarl the terrible railroad traffic jams, Wilson created the U.S. Railroad Administration that seized railroads and ran them. The War Industry Board under Bernard Baruch militarized industry, for example, forcing the Ford Motor Car Company to stop producing cars and start producing tanks. The U.S. Food Administration under Herbert Hoover used moral suasion rather than coercion to increase food production and reduce consumption of flour, fats, and muscle meats. The U.S. was in World War I for only 19 months, which was a period of stasis in the country's economic and political history. Afterward, particularly with the success of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, American radicals hoped they could institute at least a more worker-friendly environment. Tumults such as the general strikes and race riots, along with two seasons of pandemic Spanish flu that killed hundreds of thousands in the U.S., led to a backlash by middle-class citizens and the federal government to suppress post-war revolution. The apex of this was the Red Scare and Palmer raids of a few months in 1919 and 1920. That backlash broke the nascent power labor unions had accrued during the war. In the 1920s, organized workers were pummeled on all sides, and conservative, business-friendly governments ruled. Interestingly, this era of normalcy, as it was called, did not roll back the progressive mechanisms legislated earlier, but changed from government by legislation to government by administration. Well, this is the end of the lecture, and as always, thank you for your attention.